Hello everybody and welcome back to the Biff Rugby League Podcast, episode 21. And this is probably the biggest episode we've ever done. And as you can tell by the title, we officially but also unofficially have our first guests on the podcast. We're hearing from members of the Rugby League community that aren't one of us three, but are also a lot more well known than us three. Uh, in uh, Ronaldo Militala and Joseph Tarpane from the New Zealand Rugby League World Cup squad. We'll hear more from them later on. Before we get into that, welcome back, Toby. I hope Mansfield was worth it last week. Um, and Robin, thank you once again for gracing us with your presence every week. <laughs> How are we, Hello. guys? I'm good, mate. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm like counting down the days now and um, yeah, I'm well, like, really pleased for you managing to get back that uh, media interview. I'm pretty excited about that as well. <laughs> Toby, have you, have you got over the jealousy yet of me having to speak to Joseph Harpenegg, or are you still sort of self I just think that <laughs> on the back of this year's finals, I think Joseph Tarpany was my favourite, like, has become my favourite Raider. So I think that's the most jarring bit, is if you interviewed him, like, six months ago, I'd have gone, out oh, well, there's players I prefer to him. <laughs> but now, I'm really jealous. <laughs> uh, Mansfield didn't go too well, we lost on penalties. Uh, we then lost on the weekend, so this like a change of sport isn't is coming at the exact right time uh, for me. In all fairness, I think I've been a bit weak on my rugby league coverage knowledge and you know keeping up with everything this season. But it feels to me like the start of something new with the rugby league World Cup. It feels special. It feels like the part of the game that's been missing for three years now, maybe four, arguably. And yeah, so I am actually kind of like ready to be on it. I was like, and when I said just before we started recording, like we could podcast every six games, I was serious. So <laughs> let's go. Let's dive into the World Cup. And then hopefully on the back of that, we can dive into next season in a few months time. Yeah, I mean, we could we could obviously podcast after every round of games. We, we could record that and get that out. But then, obviously, it'd be really it'd be a massive turnaround for me because I do a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, but very much, obviously, looking forward to it. Does that with with you losing on penalties last week? Does that mean you're no longer in the AFL Trophy and you're no longer going to be busy on a Tuesday night? No, no, it's the most ridiculous competition on planet Earth. Um, by which, in the group stage, uh, any draw goes to penalty shootout just so that the fans have bothered to travel. Oh, it's, to it's, the that, it's that. It's not the EFL Cup. It's that crappy EFL trophy, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, it's the, the uh, Papa John's Pizza Cup. <laughs> Papa John's um, Pizza Cup. And yeah, so we've got Man City under twenty ones next week. Uh, yeah, under twenty ones. And if we beat them, then we're in, we're through to the northern half of the last thirty two. <laughs> that sounds so complicated. I'm not even going to ask. I'm so glad this rug- I'm so glad the Rugby League World Cup has an easier draw. Yeah. Um, before we get on to the World Cup, there's obviously some questions to ask for both in terms of Raiders Rugby League and York City Knights. So, and it's good that you're both here. And there's there's loads of other stuff in the world of Rugby League that has gone on that we just don't have the time to mention this week. And I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, obviously, loads of former players have sued the RFL over brain damage. Um, both Ralph Rimmer and Eddie Hemmings have had a little slap on the wrist for their comments uh, that they've made in publicly and in interviews lately. But also, um, Wigan have signed Jake Wardle as uh, Jake Bibby and Sam House will move to Huddersfield. And Wales women won the European Championship group in style as they absolutely demolished um, Ireland 44-4 over in Dublin this week. And and just loads and loads of other stuff has happened. Uh, but first of all, Toby, Danny Levi has left Huddersfield and it looks like he's set to join the Canberra Raiders. How do you yeah, feel about that? Well, he's left on compassionate grounds from Huddersfield and immediately got a new club by the looks of it, which something doesn't feel right there. But also compassionate can just mean that, you know, his mental health and he's missing his family. So I guess that's, you know, if it's that, then fair enough, absolutely. Um, go back to Australia. I think Danny Levi is a good player. It's crazy. I've looked him up on Wikipedia, expecting to see he was in his thirties. He's twenty-five. Mm-hmm. Still very um, young. It seems, like, it seems like he's already sort of a veteran of the game. He's going to the World Cup and he's playing for Samoa. Um, he's got a lot of talent. Um, I think he sort of had a chance to use it at Huddersfield and the way Canberra play. Um, you know, they like to rotate Black Wolf for Tom Starlin and in Danny Levi, who's a similar kind of hooker into that mix with he's probably a bit more naturally talented but a similar kind of sort of small nimble hooker um 
I think can um, you know can be quite promising for uh, for Canberra to be able to just sort of have a three man rotation of all and all be able to sort of contribute to the game plan in the same way. Yeah, definitely. It was very interesting. I thought I think he's had a, a very good year at, um, at Huddersfield. Obviously, pushing them into the playoffs, pushing them up into the Challenge Cup final where they narrowly lost out. I think he was meant to be one of the players that you looked at and you went, oh, wow, he's going to be amazing uh, for Huddersfield, but he may not have done everything and anything. Like, he may not have done everything he possibly could to, to really play at his top level. Uh, so obviously a loss for them, but obviously a good move for, for Canberra. For you though, Robin, a bit of sad news. James Ford is leaving the club for an assistant role at Wakefield. That it seems that seems like a bit of a step down for me, especially with what we were talking about last week with York potentially being one of the favourites for for the top tier under the new IMG structure. Uh, James Ford being very well respected, very well very well liked, and potentially going to be the next England coach after Sean Wayne if if he continues his obviously his, his rise up the ladder. But this is this is an odd move, isn't it? Yeah, pretty unexpected. Like I, I sort of, I thought if he was ever going to leave, it would be, um, it would pr probably be for a, a head coach role, and it, would, and I, and I'd imagine it would be, um, with plenty of notice because, um, you know, I don't think he'd like to leave us in a position where we're scrambling. Do you know what I mean? After everything he's done, so yeah, it was pretty unexpected. I mean, the fact that it's Wakefield doesn't really shock me because I know that he's been, um, I'm pretty sure he's a lecturer one of the um at Whitfield College or something like that and he and he has had links with the club before uh and, and sort of coached um the academy team I'm pretty sure. So um obviously there's there's links there. He, he's he obviously um knows people, feels comfortable and confident there. Um so you know I, I'm sure he'll I'm sure he'll do a great job for them. I mean It'd be wrong of me not to say, you know, thanks. And he, he has done um, amazing stuff for the Knights. And it, it's in a way, it's a bit of a shame because I'm sure a lot of the fans would have liked to have given him a, a really good send off if they'd have known that it was a, 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 his last game in charge. I'm sure that they would have put more on for him. So it's a bit strange that like he's just kind of disappeared during the off season. Um, and then, obviously, my my next thought is. What we're gonna do? Who do you know? What I mean, who who's who we're gonna um, replace him with? Like, how how do the players feel about that? Is this gonna cause some players to maybe look to leave? Are, are we gonna see some maybe make their way across the Wakefield? Um, it's you know, so it's a bit of bit of an uncertain time, and um, yeah, a bit strange now. We sort of this see, this season seen as at the very start lose our our chairman and now our head coach that. You know, those two guys have like sort of lifted the club out of a rough patch and sort of completely reformed it. So it's we're now on to the next stage of the Art Knights and completely new people in charge. And um, yeah, worrying, but I, I'd like to try and stay positive about it. I'm just so, gonna, yeah. I'm just going to throw one name at you, um, yeah. If, if, yeah. you if you'd let me, uh, Brian McDermott. Yeah, do you know I, I've always really liked Brian McDermott, so I'd be happy with that. Um, I think, um, like <laughs> Featherstone will probably say that he wasn't good enough, but like our expectations are a little bit different. If we if we got to be second place and competing up until the semi final, I think York would be chuffed with that. So um, yeah, I, I would I would I would like to see Brian McDermott. I, I, that would be pretty cool. But um, yeah, we'll just we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's going to be extremely interesting to see where, where what happens with York, what happens with the Raiders this year, and obviously we'll get into more of what's happening with those clubs after the World Cup. We're going to be very much World Cup focused over the next five weeks, and then we're obviously going to do a massive awards show, and then we're going to be straight into the off season. So I don't think there's going to be much of a break for us this year. Um, Toby's just muted himself, so I just want to make sure he's here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, someone just came home, so the uh, the dogs barking in the background. That was all. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, should we, should we, we may as well just kick start with with Group A then, and we'll start with let's start with Greece, okay? Because obviously they're the lowest ranked team in the group. It's their first ever World Cup, and there's not loads of names in their squad that people might recognise. So they're captained by Jordan Meads. They've got Peter Mamazoulas, uh, Billy Magulias. Uh, Stefano Bastos, uh, Rob 
to the R2 and Lachlan Elias. They're, they're, the, they're the main names that you look at and go, they're in the squad, they're going to be really, really nice. But there's a couple of South Sydney guys in there that you people might not have heard of. So a couple more London Broncos guys, players from Newtown Jets and the, and the lower levels of Australian Rugby League. What if you were a Greek supporter? What what would you want out of this World Cup? And because they are in an extremely tough group, they are. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess their their target for this World Cup is to win a game. Um, probably the most likely chance of doing that is against France, but I still think they're a long way off that. So um, it'll it'll be interesting to see how they go. I'll be honest with you, there's not there's hardly any names in this team that I recognise. So, um, yeah, I, I don't re- I don't really have a lot to say. I guess the um, the key the key player is going to be the um, South Sydney um, fullback. Other than that, it's for me personally, it's a total unknown. The, the only inter- the, the thing the cool thing about this Greece squad is the story of how they got there and the fact that they're in the World Cup is really important. Um, other than that, <laughs> I'm I'm lost. I can't, there's not much analysis I can give you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for you, Toby, this is a Greek team that's ranked 10th in the world. The Cook Islands are ranked 22nd. There, there is obviously a, a way that the World Cup rankings are done that puts teams that play more international games at a higher level. Greece play a lot of the, the lower-ranked teams. When you when you look at the world rankings, they play Malta quite a bit. They play a lot of the European sides quite a lot with, te- with, with players that are just out of Greece. Is, do you think there needs to be a little bit of a shake-up in the rugby league sort of the way the match rankings are done or do you think that Greece are the 10th best team in the world yeah they're definitely not um in fact I call like in my opinion Greece are the team that have the USA spot in this world cup um because of the way qualifying works in Europe got more qualifying spots than the rest of the world um and there weren't you know there was no like competition between the rest of the world and Europe to qualify you know so Cook Islands came through the rep charge and blah 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 um, but yeah, um, what I do find interesting is that there's a lot of Greek people in Australia, um, and that's that's just quite a cool little like heritage fact that I've learned from Greece's involvement in the World Cup. Other than that, um, I think it's more an indictment of um, how the Southern Hemisphere, um, or specifically the NRL and Australian Rugby League. Um, view the international game and I think you know if if Cook Islands were playing as many internationals as Greece which for a lot of these Greek players they play a domestic season they play internationally um, you know and that's it you know it's all amateur or it's all maybe they get paid travel or something yeah definitely all all the money in rugby league is in the domestic game uh, not the international game really and uh, yeah so I think that's sort of it's more of a indictment of the attitude of um certain governing bodies towards the international game um it's quite funny because i've done like um sort of who i think will start for every single team in the world cup and w- with the teams the smaller nations i've only put the players who had a wikipedia page in the team um because i have no clue you know how to research the sort of players who don't have a wikipedia page um playing and you literally name five of the six players who have a wikipedia page in your sort of one to watch so <laughs> It's a good sign. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, if I'm looking at their, their World Cup squad now on, on Wikipedia, as you say, and there's, there's, there's six of 24 that have got a page. Um, Adam Vranos, who's a London Broncos slash London Scholars player, he's in he's in the squad, he hasn't got a page. Chase Robinson at South Sydney, uh, Nick Mugias at South Sydney hasn't got a page. Jake Cambos at the West, uh, Western Suburb Magpies. These are just names that have been mentioned by other NRL players talking about the Greek side that obviously in junior systems and they're players that we probably can expect to see a little bit more of in the next few NRL seasons. The fact that they're playing for Greece now, it, it, it's sort of like how James Tedesco played for Italy at the last two World Cups. You're looking at this and going, is there any chance Lachlan Elias in, in, in eight years time at, at the age that he is, is there any way in, at the age of 30 he's playing for another country? Probably not because of the, the amount of talent that comes through in the NRL. But some of these players without a Wikipedia page, you probably look at and go, maybe there's that chance of happening, but just not yet. A player that hasn't made the Greek side, which I thought they would because he's probably one of the best hookers that he probably would have made the World Cup if he was playing for any other nation at that sort of level, whether it be if he was from the Cook Islands or 
whether it be from like PNG or Ireland or whoever at that sort of level is Nathan Peets not not in a, not in the Greece World Cup squad and a player that we probably we, all of us probably expected to see. Yeah, what well, do we know why that is? Has he has he sort of decided not to? Because that's a common thing that I'm seeing through these squads. I, I've not. That's what I'm saying. I've not seen. He, he said mm. on the 27th of August, 2022, there was, there was a post on Love Rugby League, and it says Toulouse hooker Nathan Peets has confirmed he has held discussions with Greece and will consider representing his heritage at this year's World Cup. He qualifies through his grandmother, uh, his grandfather, sorry, and has never represented the country before. He's made obviously made more than 200 uh, career appearances in the NRL and in Super League. He's played for New South Wales. He's played for the Indigenous All Stars, um, but. He, but he has declared that his body may need a rest after a grueling 12 months. He was definitely keen last year, but it he played, it looks like he said this year, I think I've played almost 50 games non-stop with Super League, then French Elite 1, then heading straight back into Super League. So with that, because, because of the way the French League works and how he's played in the winter over there, he hasn't had much of a rest. So you, you've probably found he's probably had a little bit of a rest. He's probably put his hand up and go, actually, no, I don't want to play. Mm. And if that, yeah, that, if that is his choice, then that's fine. But 50 games of rugby league in a, over a year, when we, when players are asking to only play once a week, that's a lot. That's not a lot of time off at all. Yeah, he's 32 years old as well. And, you know, you consider that the Greece pay packet's going to be rel- relatively small. He's probably gone, do you know what? Let's let Peter Mamouzoulis, who could end up being a very high, you know, a very good hooker or something, uh, could end up as like a household rugby league name, uh, especially if he has a good World Cup, for example. You know, it's uh, that you know, it's not like you're their best. You're like a full. You're not a James Tedesco, and otherwise they've got to play a local player at fullback. At least they've got a bit of NRA experience coming at hooker. So I feel like he probably did it with uh, his teeth gritted, but uh, I think he's probably made a sensible decision for himself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next on the list is the team ranked ninth in the world in France. They open. They play Greece in their group opener. Plenty of. Obviously, Toulouse and Catalans players in there. Uh, Morgan Ascari from Salford, Luigi Frey from Halifax, and Gadwin Springer from Featherstone are the only three players in this squad of 24 not from the, the two French Super League sides. Do you think that is a bonus for the French? Obviously, no Theo Farge, no Julian Bousquet, Romain Navarrete is injured, Lucas Albert is injured. Um, those those four players would have obviously probably got into that squad, and those players that I've mentioned wouldn't get in. But to have two two teams come in together to pretty much make the best of France. They're in quite a nice place, I'd say. Yeah, both both those two teams will sort of ingrained in them have that mentality of like us versus the foreigners, like us French teams versus the English, and they have that every single week. So I'm sure they'll be able to sort of like gel and be the sort of outsiders, especially when they're, when they're playing like England in their group, it's, that's going to surely help them um, come together and pull, up, pull off a performance. Um, you know, I, 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 I quite like this French team. It's a shame that they've got some, um, some injuries. Um, Theo Farge is out, for example, and um, he he's just brings that experience and, and understanding of... Um, like the the English games definitely, um, and he's and he's you know he's had success. He's been a winner. Um, yeah, I think I I, I, re- I really like that that um, so much of the um, Toulouse and Catalan squad are represented here. I think that shows that um, French rugby league sort of um, going somewhere. Like they're not they they it's homegrown talent. They're not relying on sort of um, Australians getting in through. Um, grandparents and those sort of things like this is a, a, a proper French side and um, yeah I, I, I like I like them I, I wish them the best of luck and you know it's pretty it's going to be good if they get a good result considering that they're looking to host the next World Cup after this so let's hope that they can build some momentum for the long term yeah 100% uh, Toby where, where do you see like you, you've said, you've gone through and you've named a, a thirteen or a seventeen for for most of the squads. Is this probably one of the hardest teams to sort of pick in terms of the level of player? Because I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a massively standout player in this French team, is there? Maybe um, other, maybe other than like Tony Guijo probably stands out a little bit, doesn't he? I think it relatively picks itself, in my opinion. 
Um, I think there's an interesting debate around Escaray. I still remember Morgan Escaray being one of the hottest products in Super League about five years ago. And for me, like that's something where it's like I struggle not to put him in, but I just think that he just doesn't play enough uh, to start. Um, I think yeah, um, I think their back row is pretty much set at Julian, Goudemont and Garcia. Um, I think Hooker's set with the Costa, probably Pulisier coming off the bench. But a prop, they've got about seven options who are very hard to separate, I would say. Yeah, In, they're, they're very, very good forward he, back. Alas, Azaria, Marion, Stefani, Puelch, all sort of fighting for that. But I think other than that, it's a question of whether you play like Jufre and Morg in the half and Gigi at fullback, or you play Escar at fullback and Gigi in the half somewhere, you know. I think that a lot of the selection decisions do have to pick themselves. I think Sam Asuni Lange, it's his first uh, tournament as being French as well, which is quite interesting. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to touch on. He's he's qualified on a five-year residency this this year and made himself available for France rather than Tonga. He, he, was, he was in the squad for 2017, five years ago, but, but didn't play. Do you think he's chosen to play for France because he knows he's not going to play for Tonga again this year. And he's obviously spoken to uh, Lauren Fresenu, who, by the way, is the new assistant head coach, uh, assistant coach at St. Helens, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, do you think he, he's guaranteed a, a start in, the, in this side? I believe so. I think it's got to be him and Laguerre as their centres. Um, they're only sort of Romano could come in there at some place, but in terms of form at the moment, Lange and Laguerre are the two informed centres uh, that France have available unless you put Gigi there. Yeah, definitely. It, it's it's a very nice team. I like the look of this French team. I always like to see France play well, um, and I'd be and it'd be very very interesting to see how they get on in a group where they're probably expected to win at least one game. But the game against Samoa is going to be the game that they have to win if they want to make it into the quarterfinals. Quickly moving on to Samoa. Uh, their squad's changed slightly since it was announced. Luciano Lua has been withdrawn because he has been charged with two criminal offences. And Liggy Sal from Hull FC uh, has been brought in. He, he was only announced two days ago that he's going to come in and replace um, Le Lua. This is an extremely strong Samoa side. And there's players that were in the extended squad that I thought Oh, they'll definitely be in, and they haven't been. They haven't been selected, and I'm. I am scared that England are going to lose this first game. There is eight NRL grand finalists in the Samoa squad. That's so scary. That's a bit of a preview. There's six Super League grand finalists in the England squad. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. You're the you're the stats man. You you tell me how it's going to affect us. Based on current form, I just think that this Samoa squad is capable of going toe to toe with England. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I'm one hundred percent. I think I think we have to. We England have to accept that they're going to finish second in this group, and they're going to have to play Tonga in, in a quarter final. And if they beat Tonga, they're then going to have to play Samoa again in a semi final. Like this is probably England's toughest route, other than being in the other side of the draw. Just because they're going to have to beat Samoa twice and Tonga to get into a World Cup final, it, it's ridiculous. It's abs- I don't know. I don't know if Sean Wayne's squad, which we'll get into in a minute, is going to be strong enough. So let's focus on on Samoa. Was this an easy team to pick for you? Was this an easy thirteen or seventeen to, to pick for you? There was definitely some players that are a hundred percent in. Jerome Luai is going to start. Probably Stephen Crichton's probably going to uh, definitely going to start. Josh Papali, Junior Paulo, Jaden Sua, Joseph Suwali. Like I look at that and go, that's a really strong back five. Does Hamaso Tabuai Fido have to start on the bench for this team? Wait, sorry, who did you suggest plays full back? Uh, probably Papali, not Papali. Sorry, uh, Suwali. Interesting. I I put Tabuai Fido as starting at full back and Suwali not being in the team. Um, okay. Um, may, may, may sound a bit mental. Um, I don't know. I just I think that he's quite a mistake-ridden player. I know he's done a lot of wonderful things, but I don't think he's sort of mature enough yet to be starting in a team which has uh, a back four that can consist of either a whole grand final back four. Um, oh well, yeah. No, sorry, Taylor May got injured, didn't he? Um, yeah. But yeah, it can consist of a whole NRL. Off back, uh, sort of, well, I say back four, but you know what I mean. Yeah, um, I or it can 
or it can just put Tyrone May, who was an NRL playoff um, centre, uh, in there as well. Um, so I just, I don't know, I feel like that's just that three-quarter line is, is, uh, it picks itself. Um, and then I, put, I choose Tiger Fido over Suwali, but I think that's subjective and we'll see what the Samoa coach chooses. Yeah, I think it definitely depends on if they're playing Greece, they're probably going to play their weaker side to make sure players get get a fixture and, and get like a rest in. Because if they've got, I think it's it's they've got um, England then France, right? In that in the in I believe in that order. And yeah. I think Matt Parrish has done an absolutely. A lot of the players don't particularly get on with Matt Parrish. Um, there's been a lot of hoo ha about him being in in charge, and some players were like, "I don't want to play if you're going to be the coach," and blah blah blah. And there was rumours of the Johns brothers coming in and but you look at that the training the, the squad for Samoa now and you go okay it's a very good squad they've got Matt Parrish leading in he spoke very well at the event in Manchester yesterday but behind Matt Parrish you've got Lee Radford you've got Brian McDermott and another coach that I honestly I, off the top of my head I can't um I can't remember but that that's a really good backroom staff in terms of the experience of the players that are going to be playing, they're going to be playing against the the managers. Will, the, the coaches will know because they have the experience of the English boys and the French boys having coached in Super League. Yeah, I I think this Samoa team's a real deal when you when you combine the the coaching experience um, and like you say they've, they've they've got experience of playing in England and in 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 the weather conditions against England in this um, group. And then you combine the um, the success of the Panthers and and how close knit that team is, bringing such a big chunk of the the stars of that team together is is going to be um, so powerful. Um, I, I I really like this this to my side. I was sort of reading a little bit um, of sort of mind games in the media between the coaches. I think um, Sean Wayne had said, "Oh, uh, Samoa are the favourites." But Matt Parrish was trying to say that you know we're underprepared. So I think um, I, 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 I see I see the mind games going on already, and that and that tells me that um, they are actually ready. Because <laughs> if you've got time to sort sort of like start talking about the opponent, thinking about the opponent, you've got your own stuff sorted out. So um, yeah, I I'm scared for England in this first game. Um, I, I was listening to some other guys through the week. Um, speak about this Samoa side, and and they they reckon that England are better, but um, no, I've I've got to disagree. I, I like this Samoa side, and I actually think that they could go further, much further than us in the World Cup. Um, I reckon they could bag a final if everything lines up for them. I I really like this side. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm going to move on to the the England squad really, really quickly, just to get it out of the way. Because back in June, at the end of June, we predicted our our 26 man. We picked two 13s, which was which is quite nice. You got four wingers, four centres, blah blah blah. Of that 26, only ten of those 26 made it into Sean Wayne's squad. Those players were John Bateman, Mike Cooper, Morgan Knowles, Tommy Makinson. Mikolai Ledsky, Mark Percival, Luke, Tom Luke Thompson, Sam Tompkins, Elliot Whitehead and George Williams. Two of the players we named in Jermaine McGilvray and Gareth Widdop retired from International Rugby League. And the list of injured players in our squad currently is Liam Farrell, Ash Handley, Jackson Hastings, Josh Hodgson, Johnny Lomax, Harry Newman and Alex Wormsley. That is, and then there's players that were named in our squad that just didn't get selected. You've got Daryl Clark, Ben Curry, Oliver Gilder, Zach Hardacre, uh, Tom Johnston, Paul McShane, uh, and Joe Philbin. That is massive compared. That's so different compared to the squad that's been picked. There's five debutants. We were looking at going. We don't think they're going to be like. Do, are they honestly going to play? My opinion on Andy Ackers has changed a little bit after the way he played against Fiji the other evening. Dom Young, unbelievable. He has to start. Then obviously you have you look at that. Kai Pierce, Paul, and Herbie Farmworth between them one of them is going to start at centre because you just it, it's, not, it, it's not a bad team in all but it's nowhere near as good as what we were obviously expecting Andy Ackers Joe Batchelor John Bateman Tom Burgess Mike Cooper Herbie Farnworth Ryan Hall Chris Hill Morgan Knowles Matty Lees Tommy Makinson Michael McAlora Mike McMeekin Mikolai Ledsky Kai Pierce Paul Victor the Inflictor love that 
Mark Sneed, Luke Thompson, Sam Tompkins, captain in the side, Callum Watkins, Jack Wellsby, Elliot Whitehead, George Williams, and Dom Young. Are we are we happy with the England squad? Are we are we content with the England squad? Are we disappointed with the players that aren't injured that should have got in? Or are we are we mainly focusing on the reason this England squad doesn't look that strong is because we've got seven players who, well, at least six players who would have made this squad if they weren't injured. Yeah, there's some there's some big holes in this team for us, and um, we spoke last week about how what what that says about the Super League structure and how many games that we're asking players to play. But um, yeah, I, I I'm really disappointed with this team. I think that we probably could have had a stronger team last year and an even stronger team the year before that. Um, it we seem to have sort of slipped off a little bit, and um, yeah, I'm just confused. I'm confused by some of these some of these picks there's, there's, there's players that have been left out that should have been selected people have been selected that I'm surprised are anywhere near an England shirt like like for example Mark Sneed um, I know I've been I, I've read about how um, Elliot Whitehead's trying to sort of silence the um, the Dowers and he, a lot of a lot of the media has been talking about the big three of England New Zealand and Australia, and I, I think we're miles off that. I'm, I'm really surprised that, um, yeah, anybody's got anything positive to say about this England team. Yeah, hundred percent. It was. I, I think this was actually an England World Cup team that we picked last year, um, based off the fact there's no Herbie Farnworth. Uh, we ignored Dom Young. We weren't looking at Ryan Hall, who was obviously not in form last year. Kai Pierce Paul was probably going to make the squad. Um, based off his form this year so i mean a year ago uh, like you said our squad would have been so much better toby is is are the injuries to liam farrell ash handley hastings lomax newman and warmsley are those those injuries are huge josh hodgson's injury probably not so much but he probably would have made the squad ahead of one of mcgillivray or ackers do you, do you are you are you happy with sort of how wayne has gone about covering the injuries or do you think he could have done a better job in luring the likes of McGilvray and Roby potentially out of retirement just for one last hurrah because if you add McGilvray and Roby into that squad you're probably not as you're probably not looking at it in such a bad way are you yeah sorry um, um yeah I mean I think Alex Wong's is the one which is a huge miss um, I think Liam Farrell, there's been a bit of time to prepare. Bateman and Whitehead, we know are a good second row pairing. Um, maybe you'll miss them off the bench, but Joe Batch has done some very nice things this season. So, and so is Kai Pierce Paul. So, I think you'll miss him, but I think what he brings to the game is in the squad. Um, the fact Ryan Sutton doesn't touch the team is surprising. Yeah. Um, is very surprising. Um, I think Zach Hardacre is a player who I'm surprised isn't in the squad given the sort of thinness that there is at centre or well, between him and Gildart. Um, but yeah, I think Alex Walmsley is the one player who I think you lose a lot of front foot um, through not having him sort of in the team. I think it's the Ash Handley injury, I don't know if it would have made a difference to be honest, but I think, I think that one of Handley or Marshall, or Burgess, or Olfert, one of these sort of high-scoring Super League wingers needed to be sort of in in or around the setup. Um, but again, I think this is an England team that is sort of set up to defend. The one thing I will do, and I, I'm sure you could predict this if I said I was going to defend one thing about this squad, and that is I've seen a lot of people say George Williams shouldn't be anywhere near that squad, and that is just an absolute lie. Yes, yeah, um, that's, that's rubbish in my opinion. You, you, uh, if, when we'd have retired and... Uh, there was injuries to other halfbacks in Hastings and stuff. You have to look at Williams and go, this is your chance now, isn't it? Like, gee, I think he's still finished in sort of like the top five or six try assisters as well this season. Um, you know, in a team that around him was just falling apart. And I mean, you look at like what Dar um, Darrell Powell tried to do with that Warrington team where he tried to make it like like fast and nimble mm. um, halfway through the season. And he still finished, he finished eighth in the try assist tallies, uh, equal with Ryan Briley, who obviously has come out of this season with a lot of plaudits. So um, I think that um, I'm just sort of like, I'm very happy with that George Williams selection. And like, if England win the World Cup, it will only be George Williams and John Bateman and Elliot Whitehead that I'm happy for. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, um, I just think that there's some like a lot of it just doesn't make sense. It feels like maybe a team that's going to set up to defend. Um, I expect it to be. I don't know who do you expect to be the centre pairing because I pairing because I think it's going to be Watkins and Farmworth. But I feel like it's very much a team set up to defend in that regard. Um, and that sort of goes, I think, that you can't be a team that's set up to defend when you're playing against like a half a Penrith squad in your first group game. Yeah, 100%. I mean, for me, it has to be uh, Farmworth and Watkins in, in centre because the way they're playing with the 18th man and the injuries and if there's head injuries and stuff and bringing them on, Someone like Kai Pierce Paul is your, is your perfect 18th man because he offers you centre and second row and he, sh- he he pushes into one of those positions and then everyone else sort of moves around around him. Uh, a player that I'm really surprised didn't even make the extended squad was, was Jake Connor. Like, he's had 33 try assists this season and I'm pretty sure he wasn't injured at the end of the, at the, end of the year. Uh, another player that Liam Marshall with 21 tries, Ulfert's got 18. You go that Burgess got fifteen. Chris McQueen even scored fifteen tries this season in, in second row. Ryan Hall only scored fourteen. And if you go down in terms of your your other wingers, they're not they're not on the board. Like Dom Young, obviously we know he's had an absolutely fantastic year, but M- Makinson is not on the board. He's not in your top twenty tries. Oh, sorry, he is. He's third with twenty two. Apologies, I missed him. But you look at that and you go, there's not an there's not a really strong. There's there's no replacement for for. Dom Young and Makinson, I don't think Ryan Hall can offer you what Dom Young can offer you. you he was so different, so explosive on that right wing. I think there's, yeah. there's, I'm just, I'm just disappointed there isn't enough rotation option if, if someone, if there's a big injury, because you can't just bring somebody in. I don't know who the extra three players are in case there's injuries. I know Australia have got uh, Damien Cook, Nico Hines, and someone else in their three backup sort of standby players in case of injury, but I don't know if England have got players of that calibre on the sideline. In terms of, is Liam Marshall waiting? Is is um, Jake Connor on standby just in case a halfback goes down? Because if a halfback gets injured, your whole team changes. Because it's to me, it's Wellsby or Tompkins alongside Williams. I don't think Sneed should even be starting in a big World Cup game. Maybe he plays against Greece, but that's it for me. The other point I've had in there, and I, I'll let Robin have a say in a minute because he's the one who actually wants England to win. Um, <laughs> no, I want England is, to win. Don't, I want England to win. I just don't think right. this squad is anywhere near capable of doing it. I don't want them to win. I shouldn't be the one talking about them. Is what I mean. You're, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But so the other thing that's interesting is if Andy Akers goes down, uh, you lose all potential attacking from hooker type. 100%. You know, yeah. You, no matter who comes in which is why I'm surprised that someone else wasn't there to fill that sort of attacking hooker role. Um, you know, even if you do want to sort of stray away from Daryl Clark and Paul McShane after this year, um, I'm just I'm just kind of shocked that there's no sort of attempt to really play um, from dummy half if Andy Ackers isn't available. Um, I think that really George Williams, Jack Wellsby, Tommy Makinson and Dom Young are the only four players in that team who are going to be told to attack. I think everyone else is there to defend. Um, perhaps I didn't get involved with that, but it just to me it just it feels negative, which um, which is funny because it's how Sean Wayne's won a lot of titles, so I guess I shouldn't say too much. But yeah. that was sort of, I just don't think that flies when you play an international level. Yeah, hundred percent. You you want your international team to play really well attackingly, and you want to be able to go toe to toe with the Samoans. Uh, Robin, really quick say on on your thoughts on. Your, what you think is going to be maybe your starting 13 or whether you think certain players will start ahead of others I think it's, it writes itself this this squad now yeah it, it does because like you said the, the depth isn't there so it's not like you've got players where you're thinking either or it's like an obvious starting lineup and then some, some people in the reserves that you can't, kind of hope get nowhere near playing <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real shame, but to be honest, I've sort of like written off their chances and I'm but I'm, I'm just going to enjoy all these other teams that are in the World Cup and um, yeah, it's disappointing, but you know, let's see how they go. Let, let's give them a chance, see how they go. Yeah, 100%. We, we have to back our home nation. Like we all, we, both of us, not obviously yourself, Toby, because you want Wales to win it, obviously, even though you've already admitted that Wales, the Welsh team is absolute dog. But um 
we obviously we want England to win in terms of because we're English, but it's going to be one of the toughest ways. If if we win it, then we deserve to win it because it's not the strongest team and it's quite a tough route to win it. We have to beat all three of the Pacific, two of the Pacific nations, and then one of the top two teams in the world. We need to move on to Group B because this this is a massive massive episode. So we if you're gonna we apologise if it is very very long, and if you want to skip over some nations, then feel free to do so. Um, but we need I'll to. All in the post edit. Yeah, exactly. Just just skip through certain certain teams. Uh, we're going to go to Group B and we're going to work from um, lowest to highest. So we'll end with Australia and we'll start with Scotland. I like this Scotland team. I'm not going to lie. I really like this Scotland team. Ewan Aitkins in there, James Bell in there, Ryan Brearley we've already mentioned has a has had a really really good year. Liam Hood at Wakefield extremely extremely reliable at hooker. Jack Teen B, Alex Walker, Lachlan Wormsley, all players in the squad that play very very well also massive shout out to lewis clark from the edinburgh eagles who is likely to captain the side or he is the the group captain of the of the team the only non-professional rugby league player in this team massive shout out to that man this is nice team isn't it if you were scottish you'd be quite happy with this team providing you've got players out injured and players playing for other countries like stephen Crichton's playing for samoa and lachlan cute is out injured you add those two in and you you're, you're laughing yeah, it's not it's not a bad squad, is it? Like it's quite an interesting mixture of players. Um, we've got some NRL experience in there with um, Ewan Aitken, so hopefully that sort of like lifts them a little bit. Like you said, it's really cool that we've got like a non-professional as a as a captain, and that's um, I don't know. I feel like that sort of combination of experience and you know real genuine Scottish um, like I don't know players in the Scottish league can can like create some a bit of magic um i i, I quite like um that like ryan ryan Brealy, um obviously matty russell is another experienced player in there kane lynette so i reckon um i reckon they're in with a chance of um maybe picking up a win against italy but this um group b is pretty tough um, and the only other thing I'd love to, like, to add is, you know, congrats to our York Knight, Jack T and B Nick for getting in the squad. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if he'll, I don't know if he'll um, get picked in the main team, but you know he's a good option. Like he's a, he's a big player, and um, like I, I'm sure he'll hold his own. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and he always does. I've I've seen him play a number of times, whether it be for York or whether the teams he was playing for before York. A very very good. Uh, forward and he's very much he'll play he'll play big powerful minutes if you need him to so mm. it, it's very very nice to see Liam Hood is probably their pivot their main player he, they need him to link up with Ryan really really well James Bell is going to have to bring the sort of form of his sort of music of his Toulouse Olympique sort of days nine, nine tries in 26 appearances back in 2019 and 2020 you need, you need they need that James Bell to to be on the field they need Kane Lynette, to, although he's at the age of 33, they need him to be as ever reliable as he's been for, for the Robins as well. Like you said, they're going to probably pick up their lone win against Italy. When we were discussing the Italy team earlier in the season, last year and stuff, we were looking at the, the players that Italy had available. We were raving about the quality of players that Italy have, but this team doesn't seem to be anywhere near as nice as what we thought it would look like there is a lot of unknown players in that team there's only one nrl like full-time nrl um like consistent player in nathan brown selected dean parata and richard lapori and brendan santi are the other three players that we've heard of quite a lot and play even in the even at league one uh, ryan king from whitehaven is in is in the team ronaldo palumbo from broncos uh, two from France and three from the Italian league. I don't know which one of you wants to go first, but this was meant to be a, a, a nice team, and it's not. It's nowhere near as nice as what we wanted it to be. Are you disappointed in the squad that's selected, or are you are you like okay, Italy have now dropped back to where they were pre Tedesco? You look at the players they've had played for them in the past. It's not, it's just not on that level, is it? No, definitely not. And like we were getting excited about the potential players, but there was a lot of like asterisks and you know this is um it's still not a shocking side. 
it, interestingly, they, I I don't know if it's true. I don't know if this is a fact, but to me, it looks like they've got the largest range of players from different competitions. Like as I flip through the list, there's players in French Elite One, in English League One, English Championship, NRL, New South Wales Cup, Queensland Cup. Um, there's an Italian from the the plays in the Balkan Super League. So th- this is a really is like a, a team of players that probably have never even met each other before. So it's going to be difficult to pull them all together um, and sort of get any cohesion. I mean, I, I imagine there's even a chance of like a little bit of a language barrier as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not, not expecting big things from Italy and like definitely not, not the side that we saw at the last World Cup or the World Cup before. But they've still got some NRL talent, which is, you know, better than um, other other teams that we've, we've been through today. Yeah, definitely. A player that I can't see in the Wikipedia squad is Cooper Johns. I don't know if he was the Italy player that's been dropped out of the squad. I saw an article earlier that was stuck behind a paywall that I couldn't read. Have either of you two seen that? Because he's not in that list of players, and I'm pretty sure he was named in the squad. Yeah, I don't know. I don't... He's eligible, um, but he's not. He's definitely not in the squad. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything. But that's what I'm saying. He was named in the squad. But he's not in that list. It, it's it's that that is very very odd. Yeah, it was like I'm reading an article from the 30th of September. Yeah, and he's named in that team. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's happened there. Yeah, that's that's really weird. Well, he's he's definitely in the team as far as I can see. Paul Vaughan has chosen not to play in the World Cup. He wants to have a, um, a full pre-season. Daniel Alvaro is the same, wants to have a full pre-season. Uh, obviously, James Tedesco has been picked for Australia this year. Jordan Rapana is in the New Zealand squad. Um, Trent uh, Leroy from the Storm is not playing. And Jack Johns has also decided he wants to have a full pre-season, will not play in the World Cup. There's three NRL players there and a Super League player not in the, the squad for the for the. Um, the Italians, which is quite disappointing to see. You put those names in and you go, okay, this is quite a nice team with a decent forward pack, a nice half back in there, a, a winger slash centre, full back that can play everywhere, and obviously one of the best players in the world that they now don't have. How lucky have Italy been over the last 10 to 15 years to have players that have wanted to play for them at a World Cup because they haven't been good enough to play at a higher level? Now that they've got, now that these players have developed into higher players, they into higher level players, they've missed out and they haven't fulfilled. They haven't just they haven't brought the players through, have they? It makes me wonder how much the catalyst Tedesco was in all of that. Um, in all honesty, um, I feel like maybe this is a signing team that hasn't reached out to its the talent it's got available enough, and it hasn't convinced them about the pros of playing Italy, uh, playing for Italy. I think also you've got that situation of. Um, you know, you didn't help us qualify. You didn't help us do this. You know, why should you? You know, why should I play for a team who I've never even met the coach of yeah. uh, before the World Cup? Um, I think it take it would take a lot, and I think perhaps Tedesco was and Paul Vaughan maybe were the catalyst for that. I understand why Paul Vaughan wouldn't play this year, and obviously Tedesco's onto a bigger, uh, a, a better team. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think that maybe it's just it's probably quite difficult for Italy to sort of um, put, the, put the time into their overseas players when you consider that they're about, that most of their federation are all doing it as volunteers or part-timers anyway. Yeah, definitely. Just just three of the players that have since retired uh, from the last World Cup, Terry Campisi, Josh Mantellato and Mark Minicello, like, they're players that played every single game in the World Cup for Italy in 2017 that they they played. A player called Mirko Bergamasco, massive rugby union player, played for them back in 2017. Jack Johns played in 2017. He's not in the squad this year. Paul Vaughan was in the squad back in 2017. Um, he's not in the squad this year, uh, as was Daniel Alvaro. There was, I, I think you're right in saying James Tedesco is a massive part of okay he's playing for Italy I want to play for Italy even in 2017 people were raving about Tedesco being one of the best players in the world but he wasn't obviously at the the, the level of the Slaters and that just yet but now obviously there's no argument is there no definitely and um, yeah like you said it's a shame it's a shame for the for the for the World Cup as a whole that we've we've got these situations but in, in a way 
we're just lucky that we did have those players um, representing Italy and sort of like boosting them up to be a better team than they really were. This is this is a more of a realistic reflection of where Italian rugby league is at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Which is obviously very disappointing to see because I've got an Italian step moment. It's, it, I like to see some of the European sides do well, but when when they've got squads as weak as this, it, it's quite sad. Fiji up next. Obviously, they they got battered by an England side uh, just the other day, but they didn't have Viliami Kikau, Api Corosau, or Mike Sivo as as well as a few others in their side. We looked at this Fiji side and we thought their thirty three man squad was really really strong. They've narrowed it down to a twenty four man squad that it doesn't have hardly any of the quality players in it that the thirty three man squad has. Jason Gary Gary's missed out, which I thought he was a shoe in because he's he's very well he's very well known and you know the explosive power that he can bring. It's just it's just really, really odd. It's it's not a team that I'm overly familiar with. And once again, Toby, I think when you were picking this squad, it, it definitely picks itself. Maybe other than the sort of the wingers, but even then, you've probably you're probably just going to go with Ravalawa and Mike Sivo, aren't you, on the wing now? Because the Gary Gary and some of the others have, have dropped out of the squad. Yeah, there's Isaac Lumi Lumi um, who could squeeze in somewhere, but I don't really feel confident in moving either Sivo or Ravalawa into a centre position. So I went with a senior Taru Taruva at the other centre spot, Viva Lemmy which doesn't feel like a very defensively solid centre pairing. So I wouldn't actually be surprised seeing Akama play in the centres just for defensive solidity. Yeah, um, yeah we'll see. Um, it is interesting, actually, um, how little um, I feel Fiji have sort of um, developed when you've got Samoa, Cook Islands, Tonga all accessing, um, all accessing such a wealth of talent. I'm surprised that there's not as many Fijians in the sort of Southern Hemisphere playing in the NRL. Um in terms of the bench, I actually only I, I put Lumi on the bench because he's the only player outside the starting thirteen that I'd heard of, um, and yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting squad. Um, I think that the Fiji Scotland game is actually cut, has the potential to be a really good and interesting one to watch. Yeah, we, I'm just naming some of the players in the in the Fiji sort of available to Fiji that they they're not able they're not able to select from. Uh, Tane Milne is not in the Fiji squad. No Walker Blake, uh, Tarek Sims, the Saifiti brothers, Campbell Gillard, obviously in the um, Australia team, uh, Mitaleji Vulukijapani, I think, has missed out. Yeah, he uh, he's missed out as well. You're looking at Kane Evans, Corbin Sims as well, Joe Lovadua. These are just some names that everyone will know, whether they watch Super League or the NRL. That when if they're in the squad and you probably look and go, oh, wow, this is a fantastic team. There's a lot of sort of lower level NRL and, and sort of feeder team players that have made the team that don't play a lot. And I think Brandon Wakeham is very lucky that he plays in the NRL for for, Camber for, for Canterbury because he is not a great halfback. And well, in terms of he is obviously a great halfback because he plays at that level, but you compare him to some of the other halfbacks that play for the other nations, and they don't have the best halfback pairing at all, really. No, they're not definitely not a standout. Like this, this team's got quite a lot of like youngsters in in key positions, like like Wakeham, um, like we were saying about the uh, to Tavara earlier as well. Like some youngsters, um, and like you said, some players from the um, the feeder teams. Super League, that sort of level. So um, they'll really be looking at like Coruscant and Kikau to and and the the, the two massive uh, wingers to sort of like lead them, give have the experience um, to sort of like guide this team. Um, I I quite like the team, but then I saw the result of the England match, and I know they weren't the the fully fit team, but still that's quite a quite a big scoreline for an England team that we don't rate so yeah, and it, yeah. It, it wasn't even the strongest England team there was players from the uh, from the night system or there was the, the extended squad that played that game so there was a lot of players for that England team that didn't play at all that if these guys if it was England if it was each England Fiji in a quarter final which obviously it's not going to be but or even England Fiji in a semi-final or wherever the way the World Cup draw is done it's so confusing to try and figure out who's playing who in a quarter final but it's going to be extremely difficult 
for this Fiji team to get past the group stages. I think they're going to have to make sure they beat Scotland. But the look on the Scotland team is they're very, very good. Those players play really well individually. Are they going to be able to do it? I think Fiji definitely have the talent. They've got two extremely, extremely strong hookers at core. They've got very, they've got a very nice backline, and they've got some powerful forwards. They just need to make sure they will work together. The team that's definitely yeah. gonna rule the roost at this World Cup, and especially this group in particular, is group is the it's the Australia team. We're not going to talk about the the squad numbers because they're fucking stiff. Because they're stupid. Oh, yeah. No, they're stupid. That's all we're going to say. They are stupid. I understand how they've done it, but it sucks. And that's I, it. I want every bone in my body wants Australia to get battered this World Cup because of how little care and attention they've given to the international game in the past four years. However, now it's only ninety eight percent of my body because two percent of me is a really big fan of how much they hate the international game that they're willing to put Josh Adokar as a number nine, Latrell Mitchell as a number eight, and God knows what other oh Dally Cherry Evans as a number two, and it's just fantastic. I just think it. I honestly believe they've done it to wind up the world of rugby league, and I think it's fantastic. You just said your you you said at eleven o'clock this morning your head hurts reading this. You, oh, either, no, it either you like it, it or you don't. Like I don't think you can have an opinion. I can't. I don't think you can sit on the fence with this. Do you? My like, head... Do you like what they've done? Yes, my head hurts seeing it, but that's what I love about it is that they've made it so difficult to um, to to like let your brain ah. It just look. It's, it's just. I think it's an amazing piece of uh, of whatever they've done there. Shit housery, as I would call it. Yeah, no, it is. It is, and it sucks. Um, and I, and that's all I've got to say on it. Freaking Campbell Gillard should never wear the number six shirt. Jake Travojevic is not a winger. Get him out of the number five shirt. Rugby league has its like that. That's the, like, that has what? rugby league values one to one to seventeen. Like, I don't like the squad numbers in Super League. I think you should just do the 1 to 18 like they do in the NRL. I like that. That is so. There's no need to give people squad numbers. There isn't. Don't uh, need to do it. I think that, like, the Australia trying to give the middle finger to the international game. One, one it's petty and, and embarrassing. Two, it's actually in their best interest for the international game to succeed. And three, I think they've just got egg on their face because. You, you think about like the Australian number six and the greats that they've seen a play in 100%, that shirt. 100%. 100%. And, and they've just made a complete mockery of it. They've just completely undone all that history and pride that, that, that players can have to, to get an Australia shirt. Like the, the probably the best team in rugby league, the pinnacle of our sport. And they've, and they've just. They just look silly. They just look fake. And it's going to be so confusing to watch. And like, great. Like, well done. You know what's the saying? Cut up your nose to spite your face. All people are going to watch this for the first time, and you've just like filled a couple of headlines with this like nonsense, and you know confused people who thought they might have understood, and now they're not sure. And yeah, it stinks. I'm I'm not I'm not impressed by it either. Yeah, do you know who else isn't impressed by it? Their head coach, Mal Meninga. He has slammed yeah. Australian officials for voting to scrap traditional position-based squad numbers in favour of a new system. All rugby league nations were reportedly sent a proposal regarding each squad numbers by all, each squad's numbers by organisers of the World Cup before voting on the move in 2019. Two years has passed, and Meninga, who played 17 tests for Australia, is still disappointed he wasn't consulted about the new system. Like we signed off on it about two years ago, so I have no real comeback on it. We had no idea when it was signed off. We have 13 debutants on tour, so the jersey that they get to play in for the very first test is their tour number. Isaiah Yo is number 24 because mainly of where he sits in the, on the alphabet. So he is the premier 13 of our competition. It takes away the excitement of your debutants in particular having their first test match jersey, and it's a t number that doesn't resonate with anyone because it's not the position he plays in. The only exception in this team okay is the fact that james tedesco will wear the number one jersey every other player in that squad right is wearing a, a jersey that they won't play in maybe other than patrick carrigan who's wearing 13. no one else and maybe obviously the props on the bench and stuff no one else is going to wear a number that they would have been given naturally yeah. it, it's it's yeah. not it's not on it, it it's the fact that their head coach doesn't like it it's a lot of teams might pick one to seventeen, but they're not in a position to do that because they've got they've got probably the best squad ever. 
Like Latrell Mitchell wearing eight is wrong. It just doesn't need to happen. <laughs> yeah, especially best one. Go on, one of you go. Well, I'm just gonna quickly say, like, especially when the NRL chooses to use um, one to seventeen for every NRL match, regardless of what um, what what shirt number you've won or other points in the year, and they don't, they, the whole the whole thing is not putting the names on the back of the shirts because the shirt belongs to the club and you were just sort of like a custodian of the shirt. That whole that whole idea is just being completely undone by the people that like bang on about it all the time it's just it's, yeah it really is yeah. i'd love to see them have squad numbers in the nrl next year but we're not the thing is we're talking we're not even talking about their squad like the fact that they went on a night out on yeah friday, they went on a night out on friday and had a couple of drinks the man in didn't even know about it like these yeah. these players it's, it's these players in this squad, they do not give a crap they do not give a rat's ass about this world cup these the players in this squad Right, James Tedesco, before he became the best player in the world, cared about international rugby league. You know he did because he played for Italy. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have played. He wouldn't have played for Italy in the last two World Cups. But he wouldn't. He just wouldn't have. Like these players that have potentially, like Regan Campbell Gillard, he was in the Fiji extended squad because he didn't know if he was going to get picked for Australia. He cares about international rugby league. These players obviously do care, but there are some players in this squad, and there is some people higher up than the coach that do not care they, they're not they, they're obviously going to go into here thinking we're going to win the world cup i i don't think they will and i hope they lose in a in a semi-final to new zealand i hope new zealand absolutely wipe the floor with them in the semi-final that's exactly what i think is going to happen you know i think new zealand is stronger than them and i think that they're about that i reckon them and samoa could go toe to toe with each other um Although that, the more I think about it, the more I realise that I'm being a bit biased there. But yeah, I genuinely believe in this squad. I think the only place where they are head and shoulders above the rest of um, the rest of the World Cup is at half back. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the fact that they've chosen to rest their NRL Grand Finalists for the first game against Fiji, which is which is definitely their toughest game of the group, shows that. They know they're going to get it out there. They know they're going to make it out of the group. There's so many debutants in this team. Matt Burton, Patrick Carrigan, Nathan Cleary, Lindsay Collins, Ruben Cotter, Angus Crichton, Tina Fasur Malawi, Campbell Graham, who also would have played for Scotland, potentially. Harry Grant, Liam, Liam Martin, Jer uh, Jeremiah Nane, Matt, Murray Tualangi, and Isaiah Yo, all debutants. Nico Hines, Dylan Edwards, and Damian Cook are standby players. When Damian Cook, arguably the best hooker in the world, is not picked ahead of Harry Grant, you know that this team is extremely squant, strong. Nico Hines also could have played for Scotland this World Cup. Why is Nico Hines named as a standby player? Let him go and play for Scotland because I bet you, I bet you he wants to go and play rugby league for someone. I bet you he doesn't want to sit there getting cold in Leeds every night. No, it's it is silly and like to be fair, you've seen the um, Australian squad like or team actually announced for the weekend today, and I've been go. I went through the comments on Instagram. And people, the Australians genuinely believe their third string team would win this World Cup, and that is the level of cockiness that Australia are taking into the World Cup now. And I find that hilarious because they've been run, they've been beat by Tonga in the past four years, they've been run close um, a couple times, you know, and they only won the 2017 World Cup by a ankle tap. So yeah. I don't know. That wasn't even a, a re that wasn't even an amazing England team that nearly beat them either. They need, I think they need to look at themselves, not necessarily the players, but I think the way that the international game is run and looked and the way Australia as a committee and a, like over there need to look at themselves and go, we need to start respecting this game because there is going to be a time, not this, I don't think it'll be this World Cup, but I think maybe the World Cup in eight, in seven years time, obviously, because we were a year out, but in seven years time, I think that if they don't start respecting it, the likes of Tonga, Samoa, New Zealand, and probably England, because there will be a time that we'll start getting more players want to play for England ahead of Australia that are at that level. You're looking at the likes of Victor Raddy and potentially Sam Walker in four years' time and stuff. You're going to look at that and go, okay, we're, going to, we're losing all of our top players to other nations. They need to start respecting the game as a whole. They're going to win the group. We know that. We just need to hope that they they either lose a game, shockly, and lose to New Zealand in a quarterfinal, or they meet New Zealand in a semi-final and lose. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that I think that's the best way. They they can't make the World Cup final. If they if they don't make the World Cup final, I think things change. 
Yeah, maybe that's a shake up the need. I think the sad the sad reality is that Australia doesn't need us, but but we need them. And so, like as as much as we hate it, we we kind of don't have a choice. We've got to put up with it. Like, yeah, there's a chance that there's a, that they get shocked and their attitudes off. And you know that that New Zealand squad when we go through it, I I agree with um, Toby. I think they're in for a real shout. Um, but the truth is that they could probably name three or four teams that would all make it to to the semis at least. So, um, yeah, is it, I hate it. I hate them. But, you know, we need them. We, we can't, we can't, we need, they're the best team in the world. We need yeah. them. Yeah, 100%. I, I totally agree. Uh, move on to Group C and we'll, and we'll get into the New Zealand squad in a little bit and we'll, we'll hear from uh, Joseph Tarpane and Ronaldo Militalo shortly. But we're going to start with Ireland. This is a such. This is an amazing squad. Like you're, this is this is an um, this is a team where Ireland to me make the quarterfinals. They beat Lebanon, I think. I think I know they've got Mitchell Moses and, and Josh Mansour and Adam Dewey, but that 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 sort of halfback, so Joe Joe Keys and um, Luke Keary are going to lead this Ireland team to a quarterfinal of a rugby league World Cup, and I can't wait for it. I really can't. Um, James Bentley, Keenan Brand, Liam Byrne, Ed Chamberlain, Josh Cook, Frankie Holton, James Hassan, Jermaine Jolliffe, Luke Keary, Joe Keys, Toby King, George King, uh, Ben Mathieu, James McDonnell, Ronan Michael, Robbie Mulhern, Richie Myler, Dan Norman, Brendan O'Hagan, Harry O'Kane, uh, sorry, Henry O'Kane, Harry Rushton, Ines Senior, Lewis Senior and Michael Ward. This is, this is a strong team. I cannot wait. I really cannot wait for this Ireland team to go and win two games in a group and and there's players missing as well like no Morgan Harper no Josh Curran no Dale Finucane, um no Ethan Ryan no Louis McCarthy Scarsbrook Oliver Roberts has missed out Ben Curry's missed out no Brad Singleton in there Kyle Amor's not playing Michael McAloran has been in is in the England squad uh, new Leeds Rhino signing Luke Hooley hasn't made it there's some there's some seriously seriously good players that just haven't made this World Cup, and there's players like Greg McNally that would have made the World Cup last probably last year that aren't in the World Cup aren't in the squad now because the players that Ireland have got to select from are so good. Yeah, I like I like the squad. Um, I think that on paper they're better than Lebanon. Um, coaching, I think I prefer Lebanon with Michael Checker. Um, I also think that perhaps um, Ireland selection policy, if it's still sort of saying that about homegrown talent and stuff um, for the starting match day 13s could get in the way of potential success. Um, but I do actually think that this Ireland squad, um, if it plays the strongest 13 every game, should be nailed on to finish second. Yeah, Robin. What do you make? What do you make of this island team? Because it's it's seriously a lot stronger than the the, the teams have passed. Yeah, it's a it's a good squad, and then when you add Luke Carey into the mix as well to sort of like pull in such a key position, um, I I like it. I, I I'm I'm really impressed. I think it's going to be cool to see how he works with Richie Myler, um, Joe Keys, obviously your man at Halifax. Um, yeah, interesting squad. I think like this this group, um, Group C, is probably like the most open for that for that second position for that other other um, mm. like um, team to get out of the group stages. Um, obviously, Lebanon's probably the, their biggest like rival between those two to get there. Um, but yeah, I, I really like this island squad. I'm quite excited by it and um, pleased to see that like uh, um you know one of our home nations is is put out such a good side and, and hopefully that'll um, attract some attention in ireland which is a country that uh, loves its rugby union and maybe we'll get a few people converted on the back of it yeah 100 percent. I, I do think so i believe if they finish second it's a, it's a fixture against probably we, we have to be realistic this they're gonna have to play australia in a, in a quarter final do you think they they play well against a team like Australia? And they, do you think they 
give New Zealand a bit of a fright. We've seen Scotland give New Zealand frights in previous World Cups before, and, we, and we've seen New Zealand struggle against these lower teams because they go in with a mentality of we are so much better than everybody else. When 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 they have had to have the likes of Sonny Bill Williams and that, do you think Ireland can potentially throw another shock and and throw a shock, a shock up in their group and maybe top their group? Maybe. I mean, they play... Is it... It's the last game of the group is New Zealand Island, so who knows if, if, if Ireland can sort of, like, build some form. If they've got... If they've come off the back of good results against Jamaica and Lebanon, then who knows? Maybe they, they can do it, and New Zealand might be sort of, like, resting a little bit, thinking we've already we've already got out of the group. So everything is lined up. If it's going to happen, everything is lined up nicely for Ireland to do that. Yeah, I do believe that's an outrageous suggestion, though, Brad. Um, <laughs> I'm just playing devil. I'm just playing devil. I've got. I've got to make the conversations. I, I've got to I bring think them up. I believe that New Zealand are the most together team going into this uh, World Cup, but I'm sure you'll let me get onto that. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that um, in a second. Jamaica. Now, I'm really upset because we haven't got a Bedford Tigers representative in this Jamaica squad. I know Josh Hudson that was pushing for this. Um, a few years ago when it was announced that Jamaica were going to be in the World Cup. It is such a shame. It just hasn't worked out for him. There is six players from the Jamaican domestic competition named in this squad. There is also two unattached players who will obviously be looking to, to play well in order to be selected. It's a weird team because I think this team picks itself, but I think they're also massively very much backs. They, they're so There's so many good backs that they've obviously can pick that they 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 definitely are going to miss Dom Young but you've got Moa Goro, Joel Farrell, Ashton Golding, Greg Greg Johnson, Ben Jones Bishop and James Woodburn Hall. They they're your they're your te- they're your players that you sort of have to build your team around. And obviously Jacob Ogden and, and Ross Peltier and Michael Lawrence in that forward pack. It, it's quite nice, isn't it? it? It's it's a nice Jamaica squad. It's nice to see them there, but we have to be realistic. They're not going to win a game, are they? I think my main question would be where does Ashton Golding play um, before I would go and say the team picks itself. Um, but other than that, yeah, um, I think that they've recently just been turned over by, I want to say, Cumbria. Yeah, they lost to Cumbria, which a team that... Uh, they, they had a decent what Cumbria squad. Don't get me wrong, it was a very nice squad. But it, it's a team that have never played together. It hasn't, well, haven't played together since 2010, which means that their squad is gonna, was going to be extremely different. Interesting question now, and I don't know if this is if this would ever work. Yep. But given the sort of clear divide between the sort of top five teams and the rest, would it make sense for the teams who finish third and fourth in their group to effectively play for a world trophy? Yeah, you could see it happening, sort of like what they do with the nines, is, uh, with the sevens on the World Seven series. Greece and Jamaica to watch their team potentially get a win. Yeah, so you, so you're looking at the teams that play probably third, finished third and fourth in the group. So you uh, for for Group A, you're probably looking at Greece, and then Group B, you're probably looking at uh, Italy or Scot, uh, probably Italy this year. So you've got Greece, France, Italy, Scotland, Jamaica, and one of Ireland or Lebanon. And then in Group D, I'm really sorry, Toby, but I'm going to have to say Wales and Papua New Guinea. Um, just just for this year maybe maybe Wales and Cook Islands as well you, you could then go into like a world plate or world trophy sort of thing but played at the same time just one it creates more games it also cr- creates more income and play teams will go and watch so you could have like a triple header at Old Trafford which has the world trophy final the women's world cup final and the men's world cup final is that the sort of thing you're on about yeah, uh, it's just, I think my thing about it is there's no point in having Greece and Jamaica, J- Jamaican and Greek people having their first World Cup sitting down in front of their TV sets to turn it on and watch them lose 19 0 every week and then exit the competition. What does that do for more people getting involved in the game? Yeah, so if you could, 100%. We're not that standard, but now we know that we can give Jamaica a good game, we know we can give Italy a good game, all of a sudden they're going, okay. So if we just get a few more people playing the game and we grow our standards a bit, we could be knocking on that sort of top 10 in the world legitimately, not through the crap rankings of the uh, international board. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I totally agree with how the rankings work. They need to they need to be looked at. And I think after this World Cup, they will be looked at. I think every team in this World Cup 
you need to look at and go, okay, you're seeing these are probably, they're not the best 16 teams in the world, but you need to say they are currently the best 16 teams in the world because they're at the World Cup. Okay, obviously there's some teams in there that you're going to have to throw it above that haven't made the World Cup. Um, like you look at the Middle East and Africa, the Middle Middle East African Championships that just happened. Nigeria probably beat Greece. If Nigeria and Greece play in a friendly, Nigeria, my Nigeria probably beat them because Nigeria are the best African team, other than Lebanon, who I don't, I don't know if Lebanon count as and Lebanon an African team. Officially, they are. Officially, yeah. they are the African team. I think even Nigeria, if they have their strongest team beat a Lebanon team that play, just plays during the qualifiers because we know the Lebanon team that plays in this World Cup is not the team that plays during those qualifiers like it isn't it isn't the same sort of mm. t- side but going on to that Lebanon side though Adam Dewey uh, Jacob Kuraz Josh Mansour Abbas Miski Mitchell Moses Reese Robinson and James Romanos are the names that stand out for, for, for me are you? Do you like the look of this Lebanon team? Other than the fact they're coached by Michael Checker, who always does a fantastic job with the players he's got, we've seen players play for Lebanon and then go on and have a fantastic, a fantastic few years. This is a really nice team. I think they have to build around that half-back partnership, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I debate. I debated over whether Dewey and who plays fullback or in the halves, and whether you you know you just dominate. Get you try and dominate the halfback position, and then just hope that your players can sort of go into the gaps and set up the plays provided. Or if you just you put Dewey at the back and try and stop yourselves from conceding. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what sort of tactic checker goes with there. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's uh, it's not quite the squad that had sort of Robbie Farrer in it um, four years ago or five years ago. Um, I still think you know I think. It's exciting that we've got a nation in Lebanon where, you know, another place where we've got a little hub of rugby league um, growing. And I think that there needs to be, you know, I think that this is hopefully a positive uh, World Cup for Lebanon, especially on the, when they play Jamaica. Um, and then even when they play Ireland, I think that's a very watchable game. So, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm really disappointed I've not been able to get a, a Lebanon fixture in I, there is obviously still time for me to go to some Lebanon games and if they get out of the the group and they get a quarter final maybe I will a player that two players that Lebanon could have had in their squad Brandon Wakem obviously had gone to Fiji is in the Fiji squad um, and, and then oh, sorry three uh, Brad Morcos at the Raiders or one of the, uh, the a young Raiders player and Alex Twall at the West Tigers players that haven't made this team do, do you think players like Alex Tor would have made a massive difference? Do you think if you'd had them in there, you'd be you'd be saying something slightly different? Okay, maybe they, they've got a couple more forwards that they can probably rely on now, right? Yeah, but it's a it's a slight lift, isn't it? So I th- I think this is a an interesting team. You you've literally got like a couple of NRL players and then just like complete unknowns. But the NRL players you've got actually are pretty good. You know, Mitchell Moses made a grand final sort of like led that Parramatta team really well. Adam Dewey's probably been like a shining light in a in a poor West Tigers team. 100% I back you there. So you so it's like interesting how how much of an impact those those two really players can make. They are in key positions so that's sort of a bit of a bonus. Um yeah, and, and like you said, it's cool that we've got like a Lebanon side that that gets to every World Cup and like yeah, is a, is a pocket in an in an area of the world that's probably not that focused on rugby league. I don't know if Lebanon have a team in any major sport. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to any Lebanon games either. They're all on on the other side of the Pennines, so that's a shame for me. But yeah. I, I, I still I'm I'm definitely going to be paying attention to the island game. I I I do like the island team, but I could still see somehow this Lebanon side pulling together and and getting a put, running them close or getting the result. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a really nice it's a really nice group. This I think other than obviously New Zealand at the top and Jamaica at the bottom, we don't know who's going to come out of this group. Well, Jamaica might shock us. They might get their first win at, at this level in their first World Cup and, and they might shock us if Lebanon get... If Mitchell Moses gets injured in the first game, they're going to struggle because they haven't really got anyone else of, of that 
talent, even in their, even in that squad. Um, moving on, moving on to the team that we, I think we all think is potentially going to win this World Cup. They're a, they're our favourite, and I think they're the favourites of quite a lot of people. New Zealand. There is there is quite a few of these players that could have played for other nations that should potentially be playing for other nations. Like you look at the Cook Islands potential that players that are playing that could have played for the Cook Islands that are playing for New Zealand. Nickel Klockstad is in there. Jordan Rapinoe is in there. Joseph Tarpane is in is in that in that selection as well. And then you look at some others for the Cook Islands that are playing for other nations. Holmes, Manu. Um, I believe uh, Josh P uh, Papalihi is in there as well. Some players that they could have selected that have obviously been being picked for New Zealand as well. They named a 34-man init squad initially, and some of these players then dropped it out. Brandon Hamlin, Braden Hamlin, Ueli is, and Corey Harrow were in Ira, Sean Johnson, Kem Marlowe, Griffin Neem, Jordan Ricky, Matt Tomoko, Cody Nikarima, and Brayley and Bailey si Simonson are players that didn't make the squad. Toby, is there any of those players before we get into the actual New Zealand squad that you thought would have made the New Zealand squad ahead of anyone else? For me, Sean Johnson's the big one. I think, yeah, Sean Johnson's an interesting one. I think Jerome Hughes and Dylan Brown are a clear halfback pairing. Um, so I think then you're just choosing, you know, do you give Kieran Ferran or Sean Johnson, who hasn't played that much rugby this year, um, sort of the the uh, the halfback spot. Um, interestingly, I think the back five picked itself, and it's very Raiders heavy, which I'm quite a fan of, <laughs> uh, especially with the form they've sort of finished the season with. Um I think that the forward pack is incredibly deep. And I would say I'm surprised that Corey Harawir and Naira doesn't make the squad, but I don't see how he makes the squad over Isaac Liu, Kenny Bromwich, um, Isaiah Papali'i or Britton Nakora. Maybe he's equally as good as Britton Nakora, I could argue. Yeah, um, there was there, for me, it was it was very, very surprising that he wasn't in, in the final squad for me. He was in my final squad. What I think I would say about New Zealand is, um, you know how Australian players used to really like they got picked for Australia, like Trump playing for Tonga or Fiji or somewhere, and everyone's gone now. Nah, Australia don't care about us; it's not our home country. Mm -hmm. I think it's the opposite way around in New Zealand, where I think people now go, you "No, know, if I can get into a New Zealand jersey, that's the pinnacle of my career." Um, but what you, you know, um, I think that that sort of there's that element of New Zealand where it is like still an elite team to get into. Um, and I think that's what makes them special. I also think there's incredible togetherness the way that so many of these players have played together before. Um, in fact, I think that every player on the pitch, bar Mulatano and Dylan Brown, have played together at some point in the last four years. So, as in, has it got somebody else they've played with, if you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Just, just touching on those players that you said, look, they're probably, you're looking at the New Zealand squad as the pinnacle or they're, they're playing for other teams. You go through their nickel clubs, that Rapana, um, I think Tarpane has also played for, uh, Tarpane hasn't played for the Cook Islands, I thought he had, he was also eligible too. There's players in this squad that have played for other nations before they've played for New Zealand or uh, a player at a high level of, for their club and have played... Um, and have looked to play for other nations if they weren't able to play for New Zealand. I spoke to, sorry, I had to, I had to swallow and breathe then. I spoke to Ronaldo Mulatalo about his situation and this is what he had to say. My first question for you is, um, after being forced to drop out of the Queensland State of Origin side due to eligibility issues and having also played for Samoa, what does it mean for you to play for New Zealand in this World Cup? I think that's, um, that's for me, it's kind of a personal question. That I like to keep within the group. I think they know exactly where I stand off it all, and um, you know, I feel very, very privileged to be where I'm at at the moment. And you know, with this group of boys, um, you know, they've been nothing but welcoming. Um, and it's been a pretty different situation, I guess, uh, for myself and my family. And um, you know, like I said, I'm just you know, very fortunate to be amongst this group of boys and, and this special group. And um, you know, I've made it known to them that I uh, you know what this opportunity means to me. And I think for myself and, and for the group of boys, I think I uh, just want to keep it within within our group. Um, and you know, that, um, you know, that's probably what I was stuck by. And obviously it's been 
a kind of tough that was kind of a tough period for myself but uh, I'm just happy to get through it and uh, now I'm here in a Kiwi jersey and um, I get to represent so many people back home uh, my family and stuff like that so I'm pretty excited with that and um, I just got to move on with my life and um, this, is the, this is the first step I guess. So yeah that was Ronaldo Militalo there speaking on his selection for the New Zealand squad after the after having also played for Samoa in the past not being able to play for Queensland due to eligibility issues and another another country he's played for that I didn't mention in the, in the question was the United States he is eligible to play for a lot of teams um, and obviously not eligible to play for Queensland what did you make of his response to when I asked him how it feels for him to play for New Zealand in, in the World Cup It's a PR trained response, um, but I have no problem with that. I think that, you know, the way he says that the boys know what my views are, I think that is a let's go beat Australia um, kind of view. And I really like, and I think that I yeah, get a nice little bit of passion coming through him um, in the interview. So, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, it gives me confidence in what, uh, what they're going to achieve, especially after he's had such a fantastic year with the Sharks. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, it was quite weird for me because it's the first time for us as a podcast we've had a top name in the world of rugby league speak to us about any event. Um, and so I want to I want to say thank you to the Rugby League World Cup for allowing us that opportunity to speak to both um, Ronaldo Militalo and Joseph Tarpon, who you'll hear from in a moment. But Robin, would are you, are you were you happy with that response from from Ronaldo Militalo? Were you surprised to sort of hear him say that the lads know what it means to him but then him not explain what it means to the world or are you or does it not matter what he says to us as long as him and the New Zealand team are ready to go and lift the World Cup in November yeah I, I don't think that any of the New Zealand players will be thinking like his loyalties are divided elsewhere like like we like we've been saying like the, there's something about the New Zealand um, like national team that does feel like a real achievement. It's kind of like a little bit of the All Blacks sort of effect where it's, it is really respected in, in New Zealand and they all really want to get there deep down. So um, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a good sign. I think, like you said, it's, it's nice that... Um, you, you get the feeling there's a bit of camaraderie there, and he said he said it so many times that it made me feel like there really was something that they'd said. They re like they really did sort of like um, they're, they're plotting, if you know what I mean. They sort of they they have this attitude of like we're not going to tell you what we're saying, but trust me, it's worth listening to. So I feel like they're on something. I feel like they know that they're good. I I, re I really like this team. I like, you can't pick out a single player, you go through the squad and you're like, yeah, NRL star, NRL star, great player, experience, uh, on form, whatever. Like, I, I, I like this team. I think they're in for a good shot. I think um, maybe if I could pick a, a, you know, something that might see them unstuck is they've got such an easy group that they might not be challenged until they reach the um, the next stages of the World Cup and, and then they're going to have to quite quickly play Australia. So, they're going to go from like running over teams to being thrown into tested without much preparation. So maybe that's something that, um, like, I, well, I'm sure Nathan Brown's going to be on that and, and has, has thought that already. But that's just something that I guess they've got to kind of look out for. Yeah, definitely, and and that's what I asked Joseph Tarpane. We I spoke to him um, earlier on this afternoon, and this is what he had to say about his world. Well, about the World Cup group for New Zealand and having to try and avoid Australia in the quarterfinals. Before I ask my question, um, I just want to say that my co-host Toby uh, is going to be extremely jealous of me. He's a massive Canberra Raiders fan, uh, so I just want to <laughs> I just want to say that so I can uh, ram it in his face a little bit. Um, my question for you is, who do you see as the team to beat in your group, albeit quite an easy group in terms of world rankings, to avoid that potential clash against Australia in the quarterfinals? Because you, you, you have to win that group to avoid them, clearly. Yeah, um, in our group, I would say probably Lebanon. or Oh, yeah, Lebanon's pretty tough. Um, they've got a couple of NRL players in there, but um, Ireland do too. So uh, you can't take any game. Um, you know, you got to take them all seriously. 
Uh, my second question for you is: You're one of four Raiders um, boys in your in your squad, and along with Melbourne, bringing four in as well. Do you think you guys can bring your camaraderie from your club teams into your international side as easily as what yeah. maybe some of the other sides like England, who are to, to, together quite a lot more often, can do? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think us as a playing group, you know, we bond pretty quickly as well. Um, we all got the same kind of sense of humour and um, enjoy enjoy each other's company. So it's, I think it's going to be pretty easy for us to bond. Um, it's just getting those combos right, um, which we have been doing, and uh, thankfully we got that warm up game to do it. Yeah, and Toby's question for you, obviously can't make it tonight. Is um, are you excited to lift the World Cup? He's got you guys winning it. <laughs> That's, that was his question. Yeah. Um, you know, that'd be a dream come true, obviously. But, um, you know, like Ronnie was saying, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we've got to just take uh, one game at a time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was Joseph Tarpany there speaking on his, on, on the World Cup group for New Zealand, being very respectful of every nation. On, on World Cup rankings, it is the easiest group that, for any team, and they are the number one ranked team in the world. Um, Toby, I, I, I mentioned earlier in the show, um, would you have loved to be in my situation this afternoon, or? <laughs> well, I'm actually quite annoyed that you've told them that I'm such a big fan because now they're going to have a suspicion of who the bloke in the camper van outside the hotel room is. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I'm a little bit, you know, concerned that uh, I won't be able to watch them train as intensely as I have been. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I am jealous. Um, I think on the back of the final, Joseph Tarpany was the best player at the Raiders. I think that he plays with such incredible passion. Um, I think he's developed incredibly. I remember when he was a, you know, a talented second rower who was slightly undersized, and now he's this force of a prop. Um, really wish that, yeah, I, re I, I would have been sat there for hours asking him, you know, oh, what's Seb Chris's favourite cereal? <laughs> Um, what does Jordan Rapana do on the weekends? You know, I would have, I would have wanted to know how he plays rugby, but anyway, um, I would have wanted to know everything. So I'm, I'm it's probably for the best that you were the one interviewing. Um, in Brad. Yeah, no, and he, he seemed, he seemed really respectful. Obviously, clarifying that none of these games are as easy as what they might look. He knows that the the Irish guys have got um, NRL talents. They know he knows that the Lebanese guys have got NRL talents, and they know that they're going to have to be on their top, on top of their game to, to avoid finishing second in that group and to avoid being shocked. And you compare, we, we spoke about how cocky it seems the Australian side are. These New Zealanders are definitely nowhere near that, that cocky. They they want to go and win this World Cup, but they know that they have to do it with, with the right attitude. And that, that's what it's all about. And that's why, for me, they're, they're my favourite to win the World Cup ahead of any other country. And I, I, to be fair, I wouldn't even put Australia in my top three of winning this World Cup. I think the Samoans and the Tongans could could do a number on them. Yeah, and isn't it interesting how they've managed to turn it around from last year's, uh, the last World Cup, where they sort of like were suffered from all, all um, the, the Pacific Islanders deciding that they were going to represent their own countries and they sort of had this massive mm -hmm. talent drain and um, the result they had against Scotland and no, they seem to have just really turned around and like really solidified what it means to play in that team. And um, yeah, it's, it's good to see. It's the, they're kind of the opposites to Australia. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that despite the fact that they've caused us heartache in the past as England fans, that, that most of the English um, will actually be, be back in New Zealand to, um, you know, do well and hopefully stuff the Aussies. Yeah, I mean, for, for England to win the World Cup, they're going to have to, obviously, like I've said, they're going to have to beat Samoa twice and, and Tonga in, in a quarterfinal, potentially, depend, um, depending on, obviously, how, how Group D finishes. I think that that's going to be quite obvious. New Zealand-Australia is a guaranteed semi-final, isn't it, for, for you two? Is that is that where you see the semi-final? It, it, does the winner of that World Cup come from that match? Yeah. So, what what the other option could be Samoa in the mix? Is so, that... so, so the way the the way the World Cups line up is the fact that you'd have to play. Um, um, say if say if England and Samoa both win their quarter final, say if they're the two teams that make the quarter final and they both win, they then have to play each other in the semi final. I think that the think that the other mm. groups are so 
difficult to call and the level of the, the draw or you look at the, the level of draw for group c and group d i think australia and new zealand are a, are a cut above anyone else in their groups and i don't see any other side from that side of the draw making a semi-final they would have to face each other in a world cup semi-final that's not gonna like australia and new zealand will not be the world cup final this year which which it never i don't think it has been for a while but it's very very interesting to see how that yeah. goes yeah, that is interesting. We we spoke the other week about how the like the uh, organisers have managed to keep England well away from Australia. I'm sure that that was like no accident. Um, quite well downplayed. <laughs> yeah, they've hidden that extremely, extremely well. But for me, the New Zealand side, they've got Brandon Smith, Jerome Hughes, Joey Manu. Um, but then they're just three. They're the first. They're the first three names that you read and go. Wow, you know, they'd, they'd get into any team on the planet, and you probably look further down that list and go, they'd get into any like you look at Jeremy Marshall King, Ronaldo Militano, Britain Nicora, Isaiah P- 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 Papalihi, Jared Warrior Hargreaves, despite the fact he's aging and he'll miss all those group games. Will do well, I think he's going to miss two of those group games now because of the Leeds game that they had at the at the weekend. And Dallin with Tenny Lassessna, they get into a lot of these teams. Quickly before we move on to the last group, what did you make of that? Because that was it was a warm up game, but they just absolutely ran right. They beat Leeds seventy four nil at Headingley. I know it wasn't a majorly strong Leeds side, and there was a lot of players missing, and there was old guys, and but it wasn't a, it wasn't a proper New Zealand squad either. It was it was just whatever they decided to play. Are we are, do we really need to be scared? Does everyone need to look at this New Zealand side and go, what can we do to to stop them? Yeah, I think like that was a perfect um, example of why like international teams playing club sides is a thing of the past. Like Leeds are coming off the back of the end of a season. Um, not they didn't even put out like the strongest side that they could. They probably didn't really not they didn't care, but it was very much like a bit felt like a bit like a bit of a, a friendly to them versus a, a New Zealand side that's favourites for the World Cup and gearing up to play the best rugby they've played all year. So it was a complete mismatch. But I think the only you can't take much from it, but you can take that like this New Zealand side was totally ruthless. They didn't like relax. They didn't sort of like show any mercy to, to Leeds. Um and so yeah, I, I I they are the real deal. I love this I love this New Zealand side. Um yeah one of one of the strongest that we've seen for a while, I think. Yeah, hundred percent, and and good luck to those, um, all the squads that we've mentioned so far, especially Group D. It's going to be a tough one. Um, group D, we are, we're going to go into it. It's the toughest group. It's it's a group that, other than Tonga to win it, it's very very difficult to call. I think a lot of these sides are obviously, especially the um, the Group Cook Islands and the PNG side. They're not at their strongest because some a lot of their players are either injured or they're playing for the the Tier One nations. Um, and Wales themselves, they've obviously lost a few players that through through injury, but also wanting to play, not not play in the World Cup due to pre-season or just not making themselves available for selection this year. I'll start with Wales, Toby, because I think you're probably going to have quite a lot to say. Um, there's one positive for you, though, isn't there, in Josh Ralph? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, I think since the beginning of us getting together and talking about rugby league, we've had a joke about Josh Ralph being a the best Welsh halfback. I think there was a point in time where a bloke by the name of Elliot Jenkins um, was playing for North Wales Crusaders and looked like he could actually take a halfback spot. Yet somehow a former University of Gloucestershire all gold, it looks like he's going to be partnering in the halfback. So, yeah, um, God, I, I don't know what it takes for Wales to just breed a halfback. Uh, you know, we've managed to breed Elliot Keir and Caleb Aikens. We've managed to breed wingers. We've managed to get a hooker in Matty Fozard just cannot for the life of us find a half back but there we go yeah it, it's quite a look at this welsh team and it's no and again we're looking with thank you to he can play for for providing like lists of um players that can play for, for certain countries because i am i'm quite disappointed with john with john Keir's selection and who hasn't been picked obviously no uh, Tyson Frizzell, no Bradman Best, Regan Grace out injured, Lewis Dodd out in- injured, no Harry Smith, Morgan Knowles has been picked for England, Gil Dudson was banned in the last game for Catalan, he hasn't been selected. There's a lot of NRL and Super League players there that 
would have been picked in the squad if what and what if yeah you look you, it must be quite disappointing for you to look at the fact that there's no Lewis Dodd or Harry Smith in this squad yeah. I think John Gear's got that like oh, I don't want to pick players who want to play for me you know or for every year of the calendar um I haven't got that much of a problem with it um although he did try and pick Kerr Bacon once on and Kerr Bacon's traveled across um to play in the end um be interesting to see what we do I quite like Louis Roberts um who could come in uh, to the centres and push maybe Elliot Kia mm. into the halves. Um, something interesting could happen there. But yeah, it's just uh, it's a, it's a, what if this team was in the uh, RFL system, you're probably finishing the bottom six of the championship, aren't you? So yeah, it's not an amazing side. Um, there's two. There's three sets of brothers in this team. Um, which is which is All crazy. Uh, ben and Reese Evans is one set, and then Connor and Curtis Davis, and then Ollie and James Olds. Um, you might know this. I don't know, Robin, if you were if you were very much focused on on the York back in two thousand and twelve. But Ollie Olds played two games for York City Knights. Two matches. Wow. Yeah, one he was on <laughs> dual registration from Leeds, and then he went to play for South Wales before heading to Australia to play for Ipswich Jetch. He was born in Wales. Was night, Wales. Always a night. Yeah, exactly. So, what do you make? There's, there's quite, a, there's quite a lot of Welsh. There actually, there's, there's loads of Welsh-born players in, in this squad, isn't there, Toby? Is, is that a positive for you though? The fact that a lot of this team are not necessarily just heritage players; they are Welsh-born. Um, it's an in-between for me. Part of me is of the, you know, we should really be putting together a squad that can, I like when we play European Championship games. Our squad is the second best team. We are better than Ireland and Scotland when you haven't got access to the full wealth of Australians. But then to, when everyone else can strengthen with Australians and you're sat there not strengthening, I think it just makes you really like, you know, there's not much point in watching Wales games this year, especially when you look at the strength of the Cook Island side, um, the togetherness of the Papua New Guinea side, and obviously the eliteness of the Tonga side. It just, they are just, yeah, they just don't really belong in this in the World Cup like compared to how every other team looks to strengthen yeah definitely and it's quite disappointing again for a home nation side uh, along with uh, you look at Ireland and you think okay they've done a really good job obviously England the, the best home nation side they're not they're nowhere near as strong as they're going to be uh, Ireland we said they're the they're the, they're the probably the the most they're the team that are probably going to have the most success in terms of the level that they want in the, going into this World Cup they because they've just selected anyone and everyone they can have available that has made themselves available selection. How how do you feel that Tyson Frizzell, who has obviously played in World Cups and played in games for Wales before, how how do you feel that he isn't selected? How do you feel like he isn't playing in this World Cup? I mean, it's the same thing. It's going to come down to the same thing. It's like a Paul Vaughan, isn't it, where he's been there, done that, in the Australia shirt, and what's the point? You know. What's the point in travelling all over here, being away from his family for six weeks to play in a losing Wales side, which has got a coach who he's played for before, who is probably the most overrated coach in English rugby league at the moment. So I'm glad you said at the moment because he's definitely done some stuff in his past that doesn't make him overrated. But I'm, I definitely understand that at the moment he's certainly massively overrated. We'll do the Tonga side last because it's probably it's probably nice to finish on a positive note. And we'll go to the Cook Islands. I'm really upset Adam Tangata was only named as a standby player for this World Cup. But Tirana Arona, Jeffrey Daniela, Jonathan Thord, Anthony Gelling, Keao Iro, Makahisi Makatoa, the Masters brothers, Stephen and Isan, uh, Davey Moali, Tepa, uh, Tepai Moroa, Dylan Napa, Dominic Peru, Brendan Piakura, Ruben Porter, Vincent Rennie, Ruben Rennie, Brad Takarangi, Aaron Tero, Zane Tetavano, Paul Allberg, Tevin Arona. Uh, Pride, Peterson, Rabati, Moses, Navarro, Magriel, and Rua Tapu, uh, Gatti, Kora. They that isn't that's there's there's obviously some names there that we don't know and we don't recognise and they play at levels that we might not be, um, we might not necessarily follow and that's fair enough. But one to thirteen, it's it's quite a quite a strong team, isn't it? And I'm really surprised that Adam Tangata didn't make this squad. It is a, is a strong squad, once 13. I reckon that's um, 
I reckon that's a Super League level, like Super League level side. Um, some some like kind of key players. Um, Peru has obviously won a Super League. Um, the Masters brothers, um, Takarangi at Hull F- LKRs. I, I've always quite liked watching him play. So, yeah, it, an, an interesting side. Um, I guess I, I don't know. I don't know how how much game time they've had together as a team that might play a factor. Um, but quite a, like quite a, 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 a difficult group to call that sort of um, between Cook Islands and Papua New Guinea. Um, I've I've got a couple of tickets to see uh, quite a lot of games in this group, and and I'm I'm really interested to see how this team in particular gels because I reckon they've got the potential to play some quite exciting um, attacking rugby league. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's going to be extremely interesting to see who who from this Cook Island side can stand up and make themselves sort of known on the world stage. So it, it's. It's, it's a very nice team to look at, as is arguably the Papua New Guinea side. Alex Johnston, uh, Adeni Gebi, Nene McDonald, Justin Olam, Xavier Coates, Kyle Labour, Lachlan Lamb, Wellington Albert, Edwin Epape, Sylvester Nemo, Nixon Putt, Reese Martin, Jacob Alec, uh, Wessa Tenza, Daniel Russell, Mackenzie Ye, Emmanuel Wayne, Kevin Apo, uh, Jimmy Ngutlik, uh, Roderick Ty, Sherwin Tanabi, Jeremiah Simbikin, Watson Boas, and Zev John. One to seven. Toby, this is a very strong team. After that, it, I think they're going to struggle up front against the, the teams in their group. Yeah, I'd say maybe one to six. Uh, wouldn't quite include Watson Boas in that um, assessment of their backs. But as you move on to the forwards, um, Ipape is a really nice hooker. Um, as we've seen this season, Reese Martin's a very nice second rower. But they are going to struggle um, to match teams physically. Um, especially up front, and I'm my voice is really good, so I'm going to definitely go get some water <laughs> as soon as I finish saying that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was going to ask about uh, Bailey beyond the beyond the Odo, but so you can you can think about that when when you come back. But Robin, the lads that they've got from Lee, Edwin Epape, Nene McDonald, they, we know that they have as they've had an absolutely fantastic season. Alex Johnston again has I believe broken. Oh, well, not the Lamb at Lee as well now. Alex Johnston's broken records at the Rabbitohs. Justin Ollum and Xavier Coach at the Storm. Under, unbelievably good players when they're on top form. Reese Martin kicks goals from second row. He offers a lot defensively. Uh, players that haven't made the squad that you might expect to have made the squad. Obviously, David Mead retired, which is a shame. But it was James Seguiaro at Blacktown played a little bit for... Um, I believe Brisbane this year hasn't made the squad, which is slightly shocking on my part. Yeah. But this PNG side, are you taking out the teams, the players that can play for PNG Hunters, which is there's quite a few of them in there? They play at a very high level, and if they can spread the ball wide, they're going to be a, they're going to be extremely dangerous, aren't they? If they can, Alex Johnson's probably going to score a hat trick in every game, but it doesn't mean that Papua New Guinea are necessarily going to win every game. Yeah, the, yeah, definitely. Like the backs are the key for them. That's where they're gonna have to try and focus um, all of their attack. I think like the, the thing about PNG is just like the passion that 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 like nation brings is, is the is their national sport. They love to to play in a very like aggressive um, and you know like high high impact sort of tackles. So I, I'm quite excited to see Papua New Guinea. They're always a team that I try and try and go watch. Even if they don't get the result, you guarantee a sixty to, to see a good like big it and a um, some some good you know diving corner tries and stuff like that. So yeah, let's see how let's see how they go. I, I I'm not sure I'm tied between them and Cook Islands for the um, second place to be honest. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Toby, are you back? Yes, yes, you yes, are. Yes. Obviously, Bailey beyond the Odo suffered an ACO injury in the New South Wales Cup at the beginning of September. How much of a miss, and or how disappointed are you that you're not going to be able to see him play? Because as as people as listeners are aware, you're you're quite a, you're quite a nice big fan of well, not a big fan, but you're you're quite a fan of this player, aren't you? Yeah, outside of his family, I'm probably the biggest fan. Um, <laughs> before before I did my undercover research to figure out which hotel. To park my camp fan outside off to see Raiders players. It was actually to see Bailey Biondi on Odo 
fired, planned my uh, camper van excursion for. Um, Have you? Uh, can you genuinely buy a camper van and just follow players around, please? That would be, <laughs> or just follow teams around and like do a. I am doing a World Cup tour in my camper van. Come and see me. <laughs> if I could afford a camper van, I absolutely would. But yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, um, it's a bit sad, but I think, you know, the difference he makes to this team is he doesn't get in the squad over Lachlan Lamb or Edwin, or he probably is about level with Edwin Ipape. Um, and I think that, you know, they should be able to cover for his loss. Um, you know, if he was a prop or a second row, I think they might really miss him, but I think they might just, you know, I think that we'll get a similar level of performance from this team with all, you know, that they would have given with him. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a loss for them, but like you said, it's probably not as big of a loss as not having some forwards in there. Is do do the PNG now have to mainly put the focus on probably producing top quality forwards? We we know they've always got good quality backs because they just burst onto the scene all the time, even if it's just for a year or two. Do they now need to turn their focus to producing props and second rows and and loose forwards so that then in fo in three years time at the next World Cup they can. They can move on, and they can they can probably get even further than a quarter final. Um, I mean, obviously it would help, but um, you know, I'm sure that the PNG hunters don't just exclusively sign players under 15 stone and <laughs> you know full of speed. So I think it's just sort of how the cookie crumbles in many ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, Tonga. Now this squad. When they named their 38-man initial squad, we knew that there were some players that definitely wouldn't play because they were focusing on their pre-seasons or they were injured or they'd already announced that they were playing for, they wanted to play for other nations or, or whatever. Um, some players that missed out, Andrew Fafita missed out, uh, David Fusatua missed out, uh, Conor Harrell made the squad, which is really, really good to see. Uh, Alicia Katoa missed out. Uh, Oregon Kalfusi is not playing in the squad. Tui Lolahea made the squad, which is really, really, really good. Joel Fahengawi missed out. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of comparing the 38 man and the 24 man name by name here in alphabetical order, which is, is probably the worst way to go about doing this. Uh, no Agnatius Parsi, which was a shock to me. No Tavita Pangai Jr. Uh, no uh, Taniela Paseca. Uh, Katoni Staggs, we knew wouldn't be playing in there. The um, the other Daniel Fafita for, um, for the South Sydney Rabbitohs hasn't made the squad. Um, where's next? Takiyako is in the squad. No Tavita Tautola. Um, Stafford Toa has missed out. Christian Tuapolota and Stefano Utuakamanu has missed out as well. Just naming some of the players not in this squad. Where do these? Where does this Tonga side compare to the Samoa side that we spoke about earlier in the earlier in the podcast? Um, I I mean, I reckon those two two sides are pretty much level. Maybe maybe this Tonga side just ekes out, but it it kind of depends on um, the on like. How how well um, Lola here goes in the halves. Um, they are sort of relying a little bit on some Super League sort of players versus the Samoa sort of NRL dominance. Um, so that that's interesting. Um, one thing that I think could work in Tonga's favour is the, they've got three Saints players. Obviously, Christian Wolf is left the Saints, but has been there for a while, and they're playing two out of the three group games at St. Helens. So if if the St. Helens fans decide to go and get behind this Tonga side, I think they're quite a likeable team, then maybe they'll have a little bit of a home ground advantage. They might have um, a few more fans cheering them, which will spur them on. And yeah, I think that that will give them a boost. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how it works when they get out of the group stages, who, who they'll draw, but um, if they, they're, they're gonna... they'll play one of England or Samoa depending on if they finish first or second um, yeah. in their group so I think they're going to have uh, they're probably that's uh, no sorry that would be their semi-final their semi-final would be against one of 
Yeah. England or Samoa if they get that. I, yeah, it's really that. Yeah, it's really confusing how to how how that how that goes. Their quarter final basically is going to be against one of England or Samoa, and their semi final would be against one of England or Samoa if that makes sense. So they're going to have right. to beat both of the Group A teams. In Which I think is doable. I think that I think that this this team's good enough to do that. So they'll they'll be they'll be expecting a semi final, if not more. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, before we sort of wrap up, we do need to do our, our set of six, which it feels like we started this two hours ago, and, and we did. So I we we do apologise. It's a really long episode, but we really hope that you've enjoyed listening to it. It's currently Robin on eighty, myself on seventy eight, and Toby on seventy four. So Toby, you've got some definite definite catching up to do th- this weekend, and we're going to start with the games up until Monday, which is actually quite nice because we can we can predict every game up until Tonga, Papua New Guinea before we do next week's podcast, which is really nice. So we're only going to miss one of the games in the first seven, not in set of six, which is quite nice. So first game, England versus Samoa, 2.30 on Saturday afternoon. Who wants to go I'll first? Go, I'll go first. Go on. I, I like Samoa for this. Um, I, I just I don't like this England team. I don't think that they're ready to handle the pace, whereas Samoa are, are, are up there with the, the NRL experience. <laughs> NRL winners. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think Samoa will win. And, and in a way, I kind of, I'd like to see that. Um, I'm going to go second. And I'm going to hope that Samoa do the same as Australia have done and re- and rest their NRL finalists and their their sort of bigger the sort of their NRL playoff well their 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 basically their NRL grand final players because they know that they can win the other two group games and I'm really hoping that they do that so that England win and just because I I, I want England to win I'm going to go for England and Toby you're going to go with Samoa I, I assume. No, no. Um, I think that I would I would have gone to Murray if you both went England, but I think England having a warm up game means that they might win this one, breed some false hope into the England fans just for Samoa to come and chop that false hope down in the semi finals once they've sort of got going. So I'll take England as my master plan to watch them collapse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds painful. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you've just I feel like we've just gifted Robin a point, but I want England to win, so I'm gonna have to back them. And it's all about um what do they call it when you sort of think something and it happens? I forget what it's called now. Um Manifestation. Yeah, manifestation, that's it, thank you. I knew one of you would get it. Um Paul B kicks off at half past seven on the same day. Australia versus Fiji. This one's easy, isn't it? It's just Australia are gonna even arrested Australia are gonna beat a Fiji side that lost fifty nil to England, aren't they? Yeah, I think I think like a, 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 a half back partnership of RCG and Munster is just undefeatable. So um, no, yeah, definitely Australia are gonna cruise past this. I'm, I'm going to this game, so I'm excited to see like the stars by game. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Australia. I am. I am going to turn this into the seven tackle set during the World Cup. I think because then we can try and fit all of the games in that occur before we record our next podcast. So I just need to see how many occur. Yeah, so we're going to do a seven tackle set uh, this week. Paul Sunday. Paul Paul B. Scotland versus Italy. It's the it's the group that. But neither of these teams are probably going to do very well, um, and only because we I've said they're slightly better in our thing. I'm going to go to Scotland to beat Italy in this one. Scotland too. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go with that Scotland. Quite easy. I think the next one's just as easy. Ireland play Jamaica on the Sunday at at five o'clock. Ireland win this one, don't they? It, like we said, the Jamaica side, despite the fact they've got obviously some household names in their squad that people recognise, they're not at the level of the other nations in their group. Agreed. Yep. Um, 
Game number five, New Zealand versus Lebanon. Probably the next toughest game that New Zealand have got after Ireland. It's self-explanatory again, isn't it? New Zealand are just way too strong. They're going to go out and win this group, aren't they? They're going to win this game. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Pool A then finishes on Monday at half past seven in the evening. France play Greece. Um, I'll let you two start. I think this is also another easy one. Um, yeah, I'll take France. And then on Tuesday, this game will happen during the podcast next week. So we might do a live stream podcast. Who knows? We will we'll, we'll discuss that off stream and, and see where we go with that. But Tonga play PNG to round off, uh, to start Group D next week. Who are we going for on this one, boys? I'm actually going to this game, so I might not be able to join for the live stream, but I'll definitely give you some uh, insights. But yeah, um, I'm going to back Tonga for this one. I think I'm going to join you on that one. Are you going to go with the same, Toby? I think there is a small chance that PNG could come into this game with a better mentality and nick a win. If there's like a 2-3% chance it happens, which is more than all the games we've previously discussed apart from England Samoa. So just because I'm so behind on points, I've got to take a rash decision to try and make it up. This will be my rash decision. Sorry, the, the, the cough wasn't because you picked PNG over Tonga, I promise. <laughs> um, that That's our seven games for this week. The game that we um, that will start off our next predictions will be Wales-Cook Island. Um, and then we'll get into the second round of fixtures next week. Also... Next week, we will discuss a little bit more in depth on not just the opening round of fixtures that we've had, but also the women's and wheelchair World Cup sort of previews. So very much do join us for that. Thank you very much once again to Joseph Tarpane and Ronaldo Militalo. And we look for and you will hear more from World Cup players and coaches as the World Cup continues. And we will be with you every week now. We decide we have decided we're going to be try, try and be with you every week now um, for the podcast until the Rugby League World Cup has finished. I've been Bradley, that was Toby, that was Robin. We've been the Biff Rugby League World Cup podcast. This was episode 21, brought to you by Swinging Arms and Shoulder Charges, and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much for joining us.